Father, you have given us a good day, and we are blessed by you in so many ways. Please be with us as we embark upon our study tonight. May you be present to guide, and may you reveal everything that you want us to know as your children in the world today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, as you know, we are in 1 Peter. We've just started <coughs> chapter 4, and I'm going to hold a little one. Come here. Yeah. So we left off on this verse last week. You notice that uh, blank screen means this where we're supposed to pick up, but we were in the middle of this verse. And Peter is talking about the message of the gospel. For this is why the gospel is preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. And we talked about last week that there's a lot of confusion when when the apostles say things like this because it's hard to understand at times uh, the question arises did the priest take place in hell as if a person in hell could repent obviously not so that's not what he's talking about a person in hell cannot repent so the answer and this is no the opportunity to repent and believe is in this life the priest took place to people who are spiritually dead but physically alive and that's we don't like we don't think in contrasts we don't think like that all the time you know, you'll have light and darkness, you know, uh, used in Scripture. Uh, you know, the light of the world and, you know, has overcome the darkness. The darkness can't come, overcome the light. The Jewish mindset used those kind of images all the time. That's the way they thought. So it was normal for them to talk about people out there are dead, and we're here to give them life, even though they're up walking around, but they're spiritually dead. And if we thought like that, we'd probably have a, a greater sense of urgency about sharing Christ because we it would resonate with us. This person is dead, which means they're separated from God and going to spend eternity in hell, and we have the source of life for them. Uh, the purpose of preaching the gospel is so the dead may be made alive. And and we've no bones about it. We don't quibble about that. That... Faith in Jesus means salvation. No faith in Jesus or faith in anything else means no salvation. Okay? Uh, there's no gray area in that. When Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, he's the only avenue through which we are reconciled to the Father. Okay? Uh, notice, it was preached was past tense. When sinners give an account before God, those who blaspheme Christians will uh, see clearly their sin. Who's Peter writing to? Christians who have left their homes. Christians who have fled persecution. Okay? Uh, Paul is, is, is talking about the same kind of things in chapter 10 of Romans. We're at on Sunday morning about the gospel has been gone out into all the world. And we talked about that. Uh, that and it's, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around sometimes. But when you look at Acts chapter 2, uh, when you have the day of Pentecost and all the 14 tongues are listed and the places they're from, it's every corner of the Roman Empire because Jews were required to travel to Jerusalem for Passover and for Pentecost or, you know, the, the, the harvest festival, basically. Uh, and so they were required to be there. And so they were there. And they heard the message of Jesus, even if they were from Rome or some other place. And then they went home when the festival was over, taking the message or the news of Jesus with them. What Paul was talking about in Romans is the entire world, their known world of that day, has heard of Jesus. Okay? It's not like there's some part of the Roman Empire that's never heard. As the Jews were scattered throughout the empire, and... They were, even if they didn't believe in Jesus, they knew it. Take, for example, the Emmaus disciples. They're walking on Sunday evening from, from Jerusalem to Emmaus, seven and a half miles, and Jesus comes and walks along with them, and their eyes are, you know, his identity is concealed from them. And he says, what is this you're talking about? As you walk along the way. And they stop and stare at the ground like, are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know these things? What's happened these past few days? About Jesus, a prophet in word and deed, you know, and our leaders crucified him, and now it's a third day, and, 
and the women say he's alive? What was the point? Everybody in Jerusalem knew about it. How would it be possible for someone to be in Jerusalem and not know what's happening? That's the point. Jesus was not a secret. Everybody knew about it. Everybody knew about him. And after Pentecost, the message of Jesus went to all the regions of the Roman Empire. So no one is without excuse. Did you say the 14 tongues or the 14 tribes? No. There are 14 different languages identified in Acts chapter 2. 14 nationalities hearing the language, they're hearing the message in their own language. So the point, the reason I draw that out is it wasn't just the 12, at that point only the 11 apostles, but Judas wasn't there, speaking in tongues. It was other people doing it too. Because you've got 14 different identifications of, of nationalities listed. So that's where we left off. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled, sober-minded for the, for the sake of your prayers. The end of what? Every generation lives with the idea that theirs will be the last generation in the world. Okay? For example, go back to Acts. Jesus ascends to heaven, right? You take, Jesus takes his disciples, also in Luke, to the Mount of Olives. And there he blesses them, and he's taken up from their sight, and the clouds conceal him. What do they do next, the disciples? <coughs> they stand there and wait. Like, he's gone up, he's going to come back. So they stand there and wait. And Jesus sends an angel to say, guys, get off the mountain. The same Jesus you saw up, saw go up, you're going to see him come back. You're not going to miss it. So get out, get out off the mountain and do what you're supposed to be doing. They stood on the mountain waiting for him to come back because they thought it was going to be immediate. Okay? They didn't yet understand the full ramifications of who, what he called them to be as, as his witnesses. They didn't understand it fully because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. That would come 10 days later. Remember... He lived 40, he was resurrected and appeared 40 days after his after Easter, alive. He ascends on the 40th day. Ten days later is Pentecost when this Holy Spirit comes. So then they understood the urgency to preach the message of Jesus. Remember on Pentecost, they're behind locked doors. Spirit comes and they flood out into the streets. They're no longer in hiding. Okay? So... Uh, but the one who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. From Paul's perspective, in Romans chapter 10, that's happened. Now, did he understand there were people, you know, in or Native Americans in the Americas? Did he understand that? No. They didn't know that those regions of the world existed at that point. But the message is going to go out into the world. Why? Why is why is God not brought an end to this mess already? You think God likes to see the war in Israel? You think He likes to see a hospital blown up and 500 people killed? You think He likes to see 40 babies decapitated and burned? Is God just sitting up cheering it on? The reason. The day, the reason this day exists, the reason tomorrow exists if it does, is because God is being gracious and giving the world one more day to hear about Jesus. One more day for the church to be the church, for his people to fulfill our calling to make him known. It is the grace of God that allows the world to continue with all the, the garbage we see going on. Okay? The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you be to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Uh, which is the same thing, a second Peter, same thing he's talking about there. 
Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Live your life in light of what's going on. Live your life with an understanding that this world could end at any moment. Are you ready? Are you, are you fulfilling who you're supposed to be? When Jesus comes back, will he find you being and doing what he has said is to be most important in your life when he comes back? Or will you be, and I, I've got it in here later, the parable of the talents. I, I added it. Remember the parable of the talents? We'll talk about that in a minute when we get to it, if we get to it today. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as to the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. <coughs> now, we're going to take a little hiatus here, because since I'm going to talk and I get to, um, in our world today, there is a whole lot of misunderstanding about the relationship of men and women, husbands, wives, how it plays into the church, who can be the, the clergy, who's not supposed to be clergy, all this kind of stuff. And I'm in the middle of working on a sermon series about being the image of God in the world. And trying to wrap my head around it is, I mean, we have fallen so far short in our understanding of what it means to be the image of God, that God created us to be a reflection of his glory in the world. I mean, that's our purpose for existence, to be a reflection of his glory. We don't even think like that, or let's teach that in the world, okay? But the, and it, it stumbled upon this, when I'm trying to say, okay, how is it that a man is to reveal the image of God? Then how is it that a woman reveals the image of God? And then what does our family say about the image of God? I'm trying to work on all these sermons, and of course, they're so intricately tied together. I'm trying to weave through it. And I discovered some things in my research, because it gets into the biology, that I wasn't planning on doing, but it's kind of where we went, that show us how God created us differently. It's not a matter of equality. Both Adam and Eve bore the image of God. They bore it differently. Now, you have heard me talk about in the past that typically men are bold, courageous, adventuresome. They're protectors. You know, they're the first ones to, to run into the heat of the battle if there's a problem. That is a, and is God like that? Absolutely. That is one aspect that a man more clearly reveals the image of God than a woman. We also see in women that they are compassionate, nurturing, tender-hearted. You know that they that they're intuitive. You know, and, and a woman is all those things that God is as well, because God is all those things. But a woman reveals that aspect of the image of God more clearly than a man. Okay, you with me? And that in a marriage of husband and wife, you have both the aspects of the images of God. Coming together as one. That's why marriage is unique in that it reveals the image of God in the world completely. Okay? Whereas a man reveals some aspects, a woman reveals some aspects, husband and wife together reveal the image of God in a, more, in a fuller way. That's why marriage is the only relationship identified in the Bible that reflects the relationship of God and his people. Marriage is unique. Okay? By the way, between Christmas and Easter, we're having a marriage seminar. Just to put it out there for you so you know it's coming. It is coming. We have the speakers lined up. We just have to pick the day. Pick the week. Probably Friday night, half a day, Saturday. Okay? Kind of thing. You've heard me talk about all that in the past. Here's something I learned new. As a baby is in the womb, when this child is going to be a boy, there's a point that testosterone kicks in. At that point, there's part of a brain that deteriorates. You can laugh all you want about that. I'm not laughing. <laughs> but what happens is the part that begins to deteriorate is that part that bridges the two hemispheres of the brain. As estrogen kicks in for a girl, it does not do that. So they've done studies. Okay? A list of words, all the you know things hooked up to wires. Guys, girls. Guys look at it, 
one side of the brain is firing off. Now, you might be right brain or left brain, but one side is primarily firing off. We are, we are you know, either very analytical or very creative, but it's one side or the other. When a woman does the same thing, both sides are firing off like crazy back and forth because that part of the brain that bridges the two sides is functioning for women, not for men. Now, how does it play itself out? A man becomes very determined and very focused. Who starts all the wars in the world? Men. 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 Who typically dominates in society? Men. Men. You know why? Because they're created to be that way. What you see in the wars and the domination stuff is how it goes awry with sin. But properly used with an understanding of what God desires, it is the man who leads and is equipped and created to lead his family, to lead the people of God, because God has hardwired him to be the one that gets up front, takes the heat, deals with the issues, and accomplishes it. <clears throat> but he doesn't have the intuition. He doesn't have the creativity. He doesn't have the nurturing aspect. And that's where the women come in to help the men keep it balanced. That's why the order of creation, God didn't say, okay, Husband's going to be the head of the, of the household and the wife better get in line. It's not like that. God created men to lead. But a man cannot lead effectively unless his wife is there to help him understand not to overdo it and make the mistakes that they often make. Okay? So it's a balance. And it's, in, it's actually in our biology that God created us like that. Does that make sense? Yes. It does for us. <laughs> so, so, the, the, so the statement husbands live with their wives in an understanding way showing honor to the to the weaker vessel not that she's inferior she's different not inferior in any way shape or form Adam and Eve both were created in the image of God they both are given dominion in creation which is the responsibility to care for creation Okay, But the woman is created different than the man. The man needs to understand that to be a good husband. Okay, uh, Look at the next one. Be watchful. But watch yourselves. <coughs> lest your hearts be weighed down with, with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life. And that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Now at the end of time. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be consistent in prayer. A tie to prayer again. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayers and supplication. To, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now, uh, that you're, for the sake of your prayers. Okay? You need to be prayerful, realizing the end is going to come. You need to be in prayer about that. Notice the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. We talked about that. Why is the world still exist? Because God is being patient. The end is going to come. The idea of husbands living with their wives so your prayers won't be hindered. You ever had a fight with your spouse and then tried to pray to God? Not the easiest thing to do when you're angry. Not the easiest thing to do when there's strife in the family. Okay? But when a husband and wife are truly being who they're supposed to be for each other, then prayer becomes something that unites them together. Okay? okay? Again, praying, again, with all perseverance. Praying for who? Saints. The other brothers and sisters out there that are going through hard times. Saints. So do you think, like, uh, if you're not self-controlled and in your sin, will your prayers be hindered? Right? Oh, I, 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 I don't think that a, that an angry, belligerent, dominating, what do you want to call it, husband, who doesn't understand what it means to live with his wife, even knows what to pray for in the right way. I, I really, I, I think when you're in tune with your spouse and, and, you, and you're understanding who you're supposed to be, 
your eyes are open to understand what is it we need to, that I need to be praying for my wife for? Because if my focus is on me, and I'm just, you know, you know, I'm in charge, and I'm the boss, and you do what I say, which a lot of guys do, what are my prayers going to be about? They're going to be selfish and self-centered. But if my focus is on my wife or my children and what is best for them, to the point that I'm fulfilling the role that God has given me of sacrificing myself to bless them, Christ and the church image, then what are my prayers going to be focused on? What they need. And help me accomplish what they need. I think, I, think it, I think your attitude of your heart opens the way for you to pray the right way for your family. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's just a lot in those passages. I mean, there's just a lot there. Okay? So, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. The word is agape. You know that? Okay? And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Pursue love and earnest desire of the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Now, he's just talked about the end is at hand. What does love have to do with it? needs to be expanded out because as time progresses many are going to fall away according to Jesus in Matthew 24 12 yeah. and uh, we need not be part of that falling away but yeah. be consistent in not walking in the spirit and in love and in truth and the, and the whole understanding of, of this kind of love remember there's other kinds of love identified in the, in the Bible there's four kinds of love in Greek. Three are identified in the Bible. Uh, the one you're most familiar with, Adishnagapi, is philos, from which we get the word Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Philos, Adelphos, love of brother. And that's the love that says, I love Dale, and Dale loves me. And we would do anything for each other. I would die for him because he is my brother. But Sam, I could care less about him. I'm not going to do anything for him. Okay? Because it's a conditional love. Right? Agape is the love that says, even Sam, who who is who declares himself to be my enemy, I love him to the point I would die for him. So that's a love that originates in the heart of God that we can only have after we've experienced it from God. We're able to have it for God. Thus the martyrs went joyfully to their deaths, sacrificing their own lives it lies for the glory of God and, and we can have that kind of love for God and for each other how does that how does that tie in to the end of all things is at hand we better be about loving other people enough to tell them about Jesus about the salvation God has offered to them uh, and you know there are multitude of stories from antiquity as well as modern day stories of people who are persecuted for the Christian faith and yet what do they do? They pray for the people who are persecuting them. They pray for the people who are killing them. Okay? Uh, there was a story and I don't remember all the things about it but it was a, a pastor and the guard would open the little cube window and every day the preacher was on his knees praying. Every day, the guard, the, the guard would open the door and beat him because he's praying because this was a communist country, okay? And so every day, he would see him praying. Every day, he'd beat him. And it went on for months. And finally, the guard said, why won't you stop praying? What in the world is so important that you keep praying and I keep having to beat you every day? You know what the preacher told him? I've been praying for you. And all of a sudden, it changed the guard. Are you feeding that boy? Huh? Since love covers a multitude of sins. He doesn't take a pass. Okay. Since love covers a multitude of sins. Hatred stirs the strife, but love covers all offenses. Whoever covers an offense seeks love. 
but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Let him uh, know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, understand this in light of this. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly because love covers a multitude of sins. When you bring back a sinner from their sinning, their sins are covered. What are you doing? You love them enough to bring them to Jesus and their sins are then covered. You can't cover sins. You can't forgive sins. But when you connect someone with Jesus, their sins will be covered because you love them enough to tell them about Jesus. That's the message you know, that's consistent through this. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. This is, I was going through this again today. Uh, how do we actually show love to one another in a tangible way? What was hospitality like in Jesus' day? And what is it like in the Middle East today? Do you know? <laughs> well, we, yeah. If you eating with him meant like everything. That's why it also in reverse tells us like you know, to not eat with scoffers, right? And, mm -hmm. I mean not in a literal sense, but all, but really when you're walking. You're right. Away, like, you're right. You're like, that welcome. in the in the Middle East when in that Semitic culture, okay, hospitality is a huge thing that we, we, we think hospitality is you come to the door to sell me something and I'm polite to you. I'm showing you hospitality. Or you're going to come over and have a cup of coffee. That's hospitality. No. That's, that's just normal stuff. Uh, they're, probably the, one of the best examples is when the three, three travelers come to Abraham. And Abraham uh, you know, says, you know, please let me feed you. And he gets Sarah going and he feeds them you know, this whole big meal. And the two get up and go towards Sodom and Abraham is left standing before the Lord. Uh, he is going to go all out showing hospitality. He invites them into his, into his family. There's other stories, of course, throughout the Bible. But the idea is that if you eat with someone, you have pledged yourself or take Lot. I mean, that's the best way. The two angels leave Abraham and they go to Lot, go to Sodom. Lot is sitting at the city gate. He, he knows what the city's like. He knows they're in danger. He invites them to his house. And by doing that, he pledges himself to do everything within his power to make sure they are provided for, cared for, and blessed and protected. So when the men of the city surround Lot's house and are beating on the Lord, give us those men that we can know them, Lot does what? I'll give you my daughters. I'll give you, I'll give you my daughters. Which we look at that and think, how could he? But he has pledged himself that he will sacrifice everything, including his family's life, his welfare, his wealth, everything, to do everything needful for the ones he's invited under his roof. So his daughters are expendable. His life is expendable as long as they're taken care of. That's hospitality. Okay, as the, as the Middle East, as the writers of the scripture understood it. So when he says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling, it's a serious thing, okay? How do we actually show love to one another? Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. You know that passage? Paul states that hospitality is required of all who serve in the church as pastors and spiritual leaders. Those are two references. So if you've got a preacher that is a gruff, mean, antagonistic, bitter old man, Please look the other way. Um, you don't need to be a preacher. If you can't show hospitality, if you can't extend yourself, it still amazes me today that there are pastors who don't make hospital calls, who don't go see shut-ins, who don't visit the elderly. You know, it's, it's amazing to me that, that, that why are you being a pastor? You know, uh, it doesn't make any sense to me. Each one must give as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. 
Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Our attitude toward others, in addition to loving them, we've already heard that, is to be self-sacrificing for them. Even the strangers. Self-sacrificing. That's agape love, self-sacrificing. Because... I don't remember the saying. Don't tell me how much you love me. Show me how much you love me. Is that kind of like it, whatever. Or it's as people experience love from you that the way is opened up for you to tell them. Okay? And, and we would simply call it relationship evangelism. Until you have a relationship with someone, until they believe you honestly care about them, they're not willing to listen to what you have to say about their spiritual life. But when you build a relationship with someone and they know you care, the more likely to listen in the, more, in the deeper, more serious things. It's about relationship. And that's what hospitality is about. You create a relationship with someone. Uh, each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of the God's very grace. Now, don't be confused. How many graces does God have? One, the grace of God. But it's manifested in different ways in our lives. Okay? So don't get, get confused about that. God gives a variety of gifts to his church. There are many different gifts, and they're distributed to the people of God as the Spirit wills. Now, obviously, the Father and the Son are in consultation with the Spirit in all this. You know, it's Trinity. And, you know, they're, the three per persons know everything together. But this is a role that the Spirit does. You know, the Spirit didn't die on the cross. The Father didn't die on the cross. Only the Son died on the cross. You know, uh, so they each focus in different areas. If you don't call it that. When you're talking Trinity, it's hard. Uh, and there are a variety of gifts from the same Spirit. For who sees anything different than you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? For God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love that you showed for his sake in serving the saints as you still do. You got gifts. Use the gifts God has given you to serve one another. There you have it. Perfect trouble. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> okay. Okay. It could, it could be money. It could be your ability to cook and organize. It may be one of the spiritual gifts. Okay. Well, let's keep going. As good stewards of the grace. God is gracious to all of us in multiple ways. And, you know, it may be that you've got a spare bedroom and somebody needs a place to sleep. It may mean that you've got extra money and somebody needs some food to eat. It may mean that you have just this wonderful knack of communicating Jesus with a stranger and God gives you that opportunity. You know, you know it, it could be, like I said, the spiritual gifts or those that are not necessarily classified as spiritual gifts in the listings, but other things. Uh, the basic premise of stewardship in the New Testament is that we care for what belongs to someone else, to another. God gives us gifts. We are to use them as God directs us. He owns them. I made the point on Sunday, and I didn't have any parents jump up and, and disagree with me, that it's when we understand who we are, <coughs> And God's promises to us that not only can our marriage be different, but we can parent differently because we parent our children understanding who they are. They are God's children entrusted to us. And, you know, and parents, parents are stewards of their children. Children don't really belong to us. We didn't give them life. God actually gives them life. Life comes from God. He just used us to do it. I wish I'd had somebody tell me that 30 years ago, you know, when our youngest one was little. That, you know, you need to be helping this child grow and understand who God has created him to be. Because he's God's child, not yours. Parents become very possessive. And they don't understand that. Uh, According to a grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. What's Paul talking about? 
what he taught the church. The foundation he laid, the gospel. He laid the foundation. Let's make sure everybody builds upon it, is building on it properly. The problem in Corinth is that they weren't. There were a lot of false teachers in Corinth. But with the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his grace toward me, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. This is how we should be one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found trustworthy. Okay? So I'm getting on to the parable of the talents. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that everything God everything that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Remember the parable of the talents? Rich guy's going on a journey, gives his servants talents. Well, the you know the guy that got one talent, what do he do with it? Talent was a measurement of money. What do he do with it? Buried. He buried it. And the others went and invested it, bought and sold, traded. The master comes back. You know, you give me five, I've made five more, and you got ten. You give me three, I've made three more, you got six. Well, here, here's your talent. I buried it because I knew you were a harsh master. You know, reaping where you do not sow. So here is your talent. And what, what do you say? You, you miserable, unfaithful servant. You get to put it with the bankers and he's got interest. And he takes what he has and gives it to the one who has 10 and casts him out. God gives you something, expects you to use it. And that's what he's talking about. Okay? Uh, if one is a preacher, he better be, it better be God's word being proclaimed. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. I'm always harder on the preachers than anyone else. What do I tell you over and over again? Remind me. What do I tell you? If you're not hearing the word of God. Specifically, the gospel. The gospel. You can't preach it. Huh? You can't preach it but, uh, but I, what I tell you is not what I tell you. What I tell you is that if you ever come to church on a Sunday and you sit in the pew, and you maybe you hear a great sermon, but there was no Jesus in it, there was no gospel you didn't understand in that particular sermon that Jesus died and rose so you could have forgiveness, then on that day I failed and you need to hold me accountable. Because the purpose of worship is to celebrate who God is and what He's done for us, which is Jesus. And so you can have a great message on, you know, financial well-being. You have a great message on self-esteem. Fine, go rent a town hall and do it. But church is about Jesus. And if you don't hear the gospel, the preacher failed, including me. And, and it is your job as people sitting in the pew to make sure I'm being faithful to what God has called me to do in making sure you hear Jesus. Okay? Well, then I have told people that about our church. If you do not want to hear the gospel proclaimed, then our church probably is not being because you will be in the world. Yeah. And I tell them if it doesn't come out of the Bible, we don't talk about it. True. Okay. So let's see. Peter's talking. Whoever speaks, better be speaking the oracles of God. Whoever serves. You know, by the strength that God supplies, in order that God may be glorified in everything. And look at the last of it. Can be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. What is that? It's a doxology. It's like, wrap it up, tie a bow on it, we're done. Okay? To God be the glory. Okay? Hold on to that thought. If one is put in a position of service, they are to serve. The goal is that God is glorified through Jesus Christ, his Son. Peter then concludes this section of his epistle with a doxology to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I put this in there. It's not in the handout. And the, our English Bibles with chapter and verse references make it difficult to identify this shift. Having ended with a doxology, Peter now begins with beloved, the next verse. It's we, this is the middle of chapter four. If we were actually redoing book, chapter, and verse kind of thing, Chapter 4 would end right here, and maybe chapter 5 would begin right here because there's a total shift in thought. He's concluded what he's saying now about this topic, and he's shifting his thoughts. That's why he ends with a doxology. Now, there have been a lot of debate on 
who did the book chapter verse thing? I was taught circuit riders, a circuit rider did. He's riding along on his horse and he's bored, so he's marking, you know, numbers. And that's why sometimes the verses break right in the middle. It doesn't make any sense. You know, from 23 to 24, right in the middle of a sentence. Because he's riding along and he's just, you know, because he's trying to create a, a, a handy tool to it's find where he stuff. Left off. Huh? Where he left off. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a tool for us. It's not, the, the book chapter verse is not, you know, the chapter verse divisions are not inspired. The content's inspired. We added the, 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 ver, the chapter divisions and verses, and sometimes they break at odd places. This is an odd place to have a come in the middle of a, of a chapter, okay? You, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. See, he just shifted. He did the doxology and talking about your gifts and loving others and giving of yourself and hospitality, doing everything you can to make sure people know who Jesus is so that their sins can be covered. That's the whole point. You know, if you're speaking, speak to God. If you're serving, serve with the strength God gives. All of it is about loving other people the right way. Now there's a shift. You're going to suffer. You're giving, you're putting yourself out there. You're, you're giving yourself to the world. But you're going to suffer. Who are they right now? Who's he writing to? Christians who've been suffering. Who've run away from home. Literally left their homes, left their businesses, gone to other parts of the of the of the world, of the empire, to get away from the persecution. And while Peter's letter is intended to give them hope, what's he telling them? You're going to suffer. If you're going to be who God has called you to be, if you're going to be making Jesus known, you're going to suffer. Jesus said that himself. So so the tested genuineness of the faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So in chapter 1, he's already talked about this, which that's his introduction. You're suffering, and this is why. What's my time, by the way? It's 7.20. Huh? It's uh, seven, about 7.20. we got 10 minutes. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. Okay. Notice, don't be surprised when you suffer as if something strange is happening to you. Expect it. Now, what's weird is what we're about to get to. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. You're going to live for, as a Christian? You're going to suffer as a Christian. Now, we have been very fortunate in our nation not to have to really endure, endure much. A little sniping here and there. That's about it. But in parts of the world, today, if you say, I'm a Christian, they kill you. And there's, there's regions of the world, parts of Africa, where you have Muslim and Christian nations butting up against each other, where the Muslim nations just want to kill everybody in the Christian nation because they're a Christian nation. Kill them as a matter of principle. Okay. Pakistan, India. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, why should we be surprised when we are treated like Jesus? Yeah. What did Jesus do wrong? I mean, did he lie? Did he cheat? Did he steal? Did he rob the bank? He did nothing wrong. He, he, oh, and that's what I say. Think about Christians. We're going to be honest. We're going to have integrity. We're going to be at work on time. We're going to work hard. We're going to give you a, you know, a solid day's work for a solid day's pay. We're, we're going to be helpful. We're, we're going to be good neighbors. We're going to be all the things that the world says we value. Why would you not want Christians around? It's illogical. But the hatred of God is illogical as well. It comes out of the pits of hell, so you know it's going to be illogical. Okay? Here's what's the word for surprised has to do with receiving a guest whom you, to whom you will be hospitable. That's the thing. What are we talking about hospitality? That you embrace it you, you're, when you're hospitable, when you extend hospitality to someone, you bring them into your home and they become family. He's saying that is how we're supposed to treat suffering. 
which blew my mind when I realized this. That's why I put the Greek words up here. Meaning to receive a guest, uh, to, you know, to be surprised, to, you know, to give lodging, to you know, lodge, to stay. Okay? When suffering comes, here's the, do not be surprised. When the suffering comes, be hospitable to it. Embrace it. Take it into your life as something that is you are now responsible for and that you're going to take care of and oversee, protect, whatever, because you're doing it for Christ. It's a backwards way of thinking about it, that we are going to embrace the suffering that comes and be hospitable when tribulation comes our way. That's got to be a God thing. Because apart from, you know, in the flesh, we think of suffering and we want to run from it, we want to hide from it. He's saying, be hospitable to it, embrace it. And that's the point. Uh, this is another Greek word, you know, to be generous to your guests, to show hospitality, uh, which is, uh, it's this word, the second half here, with the word philos, love, on the front of it. Love this one you're hospitable to when they come. It's hard for us to wrap our minds around being hospitable, as we talk about hospitality, to tribulation and suffering. But remember, it's about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's that, you know, what we are going through, we're doing for the glory of God in his name. So it's about him. And in reality, it's never about us. Our lives, we live our lives for ourselves, we get in all kinds of trouble. We live our lives for Jesus, and all of a sudden, if trouble comes away, it's about him. It's not about us. It's like if I tell Dale that Jesus you know, really loves him and cares about him, and Dale cusses me out and tells me I'm no good, you know, rotten jerk for telling him that. And I've had people do that. And they you know, all but spit in your face because they don't want to hear it. Who's he rejecting? Me? Jesus. He's rejecting God. And so I can take it personally and get offended, but then it's about me. It's about Jesus. And the, rea and the proper response is to be sad because he's missing out on what God wants him to have. It's not about me. Anytime we make it about me, about us, turn, turn everything inward, it, it becomes selfish. And God, God is always put on the back burner when we're being selfish. As Christians, we are directed to show hospitality. We are told to receive all who come to us. Now Peter turns this application on its ear and says we are to receive suffering which comes to us, to welcome it, and to accept it as part of our Christian obligation. How does that strike you? Huh? It's difficult. It's difficult. It is. I mean, it is. But here's something. I, I, we're we're going to stop there because we're going to run out of time. But here's something I thought about. I cannot explain it. I can't tell you that I've experienced it. It's something I simply believe maybe intuitively, okay? That all the people who have suffered throughout the centuries because of Christians, the martyrs who were, you know, like Peter were crucified and, you know, Thomas's bludgeoned death and Philip has run through with a spear and all these things that they've, that they've happened. Stephen stoned to death. That at that moment... God was present with them, giving the ability to testify and glorify him even as they suffered martyrdom. I believe that. Because our natural instinct is what? Run and hide. How can someone have the fortitude and the boldness to stand in front when they come after you? I, think, I really think it has to be a God thing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And I really think that at that moment in a person's life, that God gives them that extra anointing of faith to say, it's coming, I'm good with God, I'm at peace with it, let it come. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a God intervention moment was how I would see it. <laughs> yeah, it'll be over soon, yeah. Any thoughts? We're going to close it up. Can I say something? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. There's a book that you find to sell, you know, and I cannot remember the name of it, but it's like God answers questions and then God answers questions for tease. But it's totally written from somebody, I don't remember the guy's name, but there's nothing biblical about it. 
so, so Scholastic Books is making a book available for kids and teens. God answers questions, I'll send you that. but it's not biblical. It's not biblical. Hmm. Well, that's going to deceive a lot of people. That's going to be. Yeah. Right. Well, it's like you heard me talk about, uh, for those of you who don't know it, did you know that China is writing a Bible, producing a Bible? Mm -hmm. And in the Bible they're producing for the Chinese people, the the text is, is rewritten to encourage people to be obedient to the state. So, for example, when Jesus says, let the one who has no sin cast the first stone, and no one casts any stones at the woman caught committing adultery, Jesus stones her to death because she violated the principles of society. And that will become a standard book that the Chinese people have. It'll filter into other parts of the world. And it's going to deceive a lot of people. China's got the money and the backing to produce it. They've been working on it for years. Now it's about to come out. And, and because it's a Bible, it's going to deceive a lot of people. So it's like that. God answers questions. It's going to deceive a lot of people. But that's, that's what Satan does. He takes the truth and twists it just enough to turn it into a lie. That's, that's why the world hates us, like you were saying a while ago. Yeah, so it's right. true. Because, yeah, because Christ is truth. He's truth and life. And the world is from the Father of lies. So that's why we'll be persecuted. Because, yeah. like, if we stand bold to the truth, saying the only way is Christ. Mm -hmm. And in the world, no, there's many ways. Mm -hmm. No, there's this. You can do this. You know, but we just we just stand bold to the, to the gospel of Jesus Christ, like, mm -hmm. no, he's the only way to be saved, you know, that's why they would hate us, and oh, yeah, the do. Us and well, and I think that part of the reason people hate us, too, is because <clears throat> we're all born to be children of God, the people who are, that go down a different path, deep in their heart, they know, and that's why they hate Christianity more than anything. Our presence they is a guilt. Our, our, our very presence <clears throat> creates guilt in their lives. And how you were saying about um, the hatred for God, I when I come across people who have this hatred for God, I always use the quote from Christ on that. I always say, how can you hate something that doesn't exist? They, when they claim to be an atheist. And they always get super quiet and they don't know what to say. And I'm like, you can't hate something that you say doesn't exist. Yeah. You can't. Sure. So, but. Well, I'm, I'm sticking around to talk all night. I'm going to pray, and those who need to leave can leave, get your kids, but we'll stay around and talk. Father, thank you for this time tonight. Bless our kids and all that they're learning while they're here. We thank you for their presence with us, and may you continue to bless us as a church that we might simply be all that you desire for us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder.